Good morning, good morning ladies and gentlemen, if we still consider midday a morning in Kiev. But I do hope you are considering this a morning and I do hope that you've already woken up and you're all ready to join yet another day at International Documentary Human Rights Film Festival DocuDays UA. I hope that you've already know perfectly how to use all of the platforms that we've prepared for you, especially for the online edition of DocuDays UA and Film Festival. And I do hope that you already know by heart just as I do that in order to watch all of the festival films you have to go to docuspace.org in order to join any kind of sessions that we're providing which is actually this morning workouts the soups with directors when you can discuss all of the competition films and all of the competition programs the docu class when we're also discussing the significant issues concerning human rights the right now program specifically dedicated to target those issues and tete a tete evening sessions in order to talk to Ukrainian program, the National Competition Directors and our special invited guests, which is actually the greatest way to spend your evening hours just before you will get a little bit relaxation with our happy hours. So you perfectly know that in order to get all of this, the full day of the best selected content for you, you just have to click the DocuDays UA site or join us at Facebook or YouTube. And as far as I do believe that there is some people listening to us now through one of those platforms. I'd like to once again to greet you all now at this morning workout session. Today we're going to be discussing a very specific topic and I do believe that we're going to give you a little bit of relaxation for the day. It's raining a little bit in Kiev today. This is the best day to discuss poetry and how it is intertwined with cinema because I do believe that both poetry and film has a lot in common, especially when we're speaking about building non-figurative imaging, for example. But in order to discuss poetry today, we have a very special guest. Please welcome Mos Carpelli. She's our guest. She's representing one of the film in our competition program, Ambassa. You can still check it out at docudayspace.org. I do believe you already know that by heart. And Mo. Hello, good morning. Hi. How are you today? <laughs> good morning. I'm great. I'm great. I've been in, in, I live in Rome, so it's sunny here today, which is nice, but uh, the quarantine here, as I'm sure people know, is quite serious. So mm -hmm. uh, I've been spending most of my mornings waking up reading poetry to kind of stay in good spirits. Um, mm -hmm. And so that was the reason behind wanting to share some of it. Oh, but that's really good. You know, I do believe that sometimes poetry, because it's so much ingrained into language, it's almost like a prayer-like practice. So, mm -hmm. like, I also have this kind of thing. I'm very much into Ukrainian modernistic poetry, and I have my favorite poet who's always helping me out through, you know, the darkest times. I'm not very oh, much wow, into yeah. prayers, but I'm very much into poetry. <laughs> so I'm also using it a little bit as, you know, self-calming practice. But yes, you know, yeah. And I, as far as I know, you know, even in your cinematic practices, you're very much connected to the poetry and the way you build your images in the film and just the way you're framing it, all of it. So why is that? So how come you fell in love with poetry? Well, I think, I think poetry is the most honest art form. I think it doesn't, there's no tricks. You can feel them in poetry, you know? Um, it's so simple. It's, 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 it's very simple and everybody can find different ways um, to harness that simplicity in their own language. So uh, one of the biggest shames of poetry though, I mean, images are translatable throughout. You can create imagery that is poetic, that is a kind of poetry, and it will speak to people of all different cultures and people of all different languages. One of the hard parts about poetry is that it's very hard to translate, you know, and to like get all the context and the nuance. But at the same time, I'm really, I'm learning that I'm, I'm, I'm very grateful for translators who translate poetry because that seems like such a difficult job, you know? It's the most simple things can change an entire, an entire poem. So I think images can be that way too within film. You can linger on something just a little longer and it can create a sensation or, or some sort of emotive um, practice within the viewer. And, and so you have this way of working with a very simple thing, image and sound, and the way that you marry those things or juxtapose them creates creates its own version of poetry that is is very specific very intricate 
And, and also, you know, the very same, the image system as well as language, it gives a lot of space for interpretation because everyone can read the very same poem, read the very same text, but find something that only speaks to them. And the very same, basically, with film. And I, I understand that maybe that's something you hear many times when people are starting to interpret your film and get it with the senses that you mightn't have thought of mm -hmm. while you were making it. So, yeah, I think that, you know, poetry and film is very much interconnected. But also, you have Italian-American regions. So I do believe, and now you're residing in Rome, so you can fluently speak both English and Italian language. So which no, language I don't. I'm not you? fluent in Italian oh. yet. <laughs> Unfortunately, I grew up in the United States, and I've been living in well the last two years. I've been living in Venezuela and Toronto, and then we just moved to Rome right before this quarantine. So it wasn't the perfect time to come, but but actually, kind of is because now we're. It's a strange time here, but I, I'm really loving it, and I'm, I'm able to to practice my Italian. And um, but I'm, you know, I, I with Spanish too. I started to uh, I learned Spanish more Spanish in the last few few years, working on my latest film in Venezuela. And there's a special special thing, you know, when you start learning a language, you learn how to get around, how to read a recipe, how to say things and not, you know, offend anyone. <laughs> And then you get little by little, and then eventually you get to a place where you can read poetry and you can understand these nuances. And that's when you're like, oh, okay, I think I'm starting to grasp the language. So I'm looking forward to that happening here in Italian. And I actually already have some Italian poets that have been recommended. So that's mm -hmm. on my, my list to do. <laughs> Well, that's cool. I, but I hope you will you'll manage to do that in a less frustrating environment. So it's not going to be happening during the current time. So I guess like soon, when everything's going to be back to yeah. normal or to new normal, then you'll have a chance yeah. also to explore Italian in its full scope. But you have prepared some poems for, to share with us. Would you like to start with some yes. specific one? And maybe you will just like introduce yeah. us to why the reason you've chosen it. Yeah, so I've been getting um, poetry uh, from Poetry Magazine. It's in the United States, and it's a it's a it's the best poetry magazine in the U.S. It has the most simple title, so if you want to look it up online, it's just called Poetry Magazine. Um, and I used to get their their magazine in the mail, and I just recently subscribed to it to get it sent all the way to Rome because I miss the poetry. It's some of the best poetry coming from all around the world. Some of it is translated. Um, but, I, but I recently signed up for getting a new poem every day, and these are my favorite selections of the last month or two months. Um, they've kind of been choosing poems that have to do sometimes with nature or with isolation, you know, to kind of speak about the quarantine and stuff. So I chose one poem that is, well, I just like it. It's a very, um, it's, a, it's a sweet poem. I like it. And then I chose another that is, uh, a little more fun to just say the words out loud. So I was looking forward to, I've been saying all these poems in my head, you know, as I've been reading them. So I'm excited to kind of try this one out loud. Um, and then the third poem is uh, called The Current Isolationalism. It's actually about, uh, well, it doesn't have to be, but it is about, for me, the quarantine. So um, it's, it's quite relevant. So those are the three that I had prepared. And then I, ha I have more if we have more time, but I actually, Kate, because you, um, because you, you mentioned that you have some poems, I would like to kind of open it up to you after, <laughs> after we get it to read some of these and hear some of your poems that you've selected as well, because that would be really cool. Well, we'll just, I think we'll just begin and we'll see how it goes. <laughs> Our interpreter yeah. still, I think, going to kill us because, well, right now, I'm very, very grateful to all of our interpreters, the brave people who are doing the Ukrainian translation right now. I know how it feels. <laughs> I'm building your shoes most of the times, but thank you very much for doing this. And I think now we'll be able, with your help, enjoy the beauty of poetry. <laughs> yes, thank you. Okay, so the first poem is called Tell the Bees, and it is by Sarah Lindsay. Tell the bees, they require news of the house. They must know, lest they sicken from the gap between their ignorance and our grief. Speak in a whisper. Tie a black swatch to a stick and attach the stick to their hive. From the fortress of casseroles and desserts built in the kitchen these past few weeks, as though hunger were the enemy, remove a slice of cake and lay it where they can slowly draw it in, making a mournful sound. And tell the fly that has knocked on the window all day, tell the red bird that rammed the glass from the outside and stands two days to go. 
Tell the grass, though it's already guessed, and the ground clenched in furrows. Tell the water you spill on the ground, then all the water will know, and the last shrunken pearl of snow in its hiding place. Tell the blighted elms and the young oaks we plant instead, the water bug while it scribbles a hundred lines that dissolve behind it. The lichen when it, while it etches deeper its single room, the boulders letting their fissures widen, the pebbles which have no more to lose, the hills, they will be slightly smaller as always when the bees fly out tomorrow to look for sweetness and find their way because nothing has changed, nothing else has changed. Wow. <laughs> I like this poem a lot because, yeah, it's beautiful. I love this poem because this is kind of my world in a way. I live in this apartment with, we open the windows in the morning and we get one or two flies and maybe a bee or, you know, and I love the way the poetry can focus and, and, and film is like this too, can focus on something so small and intricate, like a fly going through the room and it becomes a, a world, you know, it becomes an experience. But then the poem ends with something very beautiful that says, um, because nothing else has changed. It kind of sucks you back to the earth to be like, oh yeah, <laughs> the world has like stayed the same. I just went into poetry, you know, and now I'm coming out. So but I love this poem for that reason. Oh no, now I can't hear you, Gates. I'm not sure why. Or no? Ah, now I can hear you. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> good. I was I was just saying that basically, well, you know, it remind me again of what you were saying is basically, you know, you can, with the help of poetry, you can actually put the specific angle to the aspect of life you might not have been noticing. Like you have the life of your own, but there is a completely different life that's happening in the very same moment. Even though, as you said, and as the poem said, the life, the world hasn't changed. Anything else in the world hasn't changed at all. So yeah, this is basically the very, very good beauty of the poetry that it also has this opportunity to make this camera angles. But have you ever tried to write poetry yourself? Yes, I've been writing a poem every day for the last two weeks. And before that I was writing a little bit, but now I make it like a practice every day to get up and write a poem. And it, it helps me get, in, get into... Um, Get it, yeah, get into the space, I guess, that this poem that we're talking about does, you know, where you can focus on the little things and the little gestures of the world. And, and that's really helpful to me because I, I get a lot of my inspiration for my work, shooting mm -hmm. doc mostly documentary films. I get a lot of my inspiration through watching things outside of me, but I can't really do that in the same capacity right now. So trying to derive some sort of inspiration from even the smallest things and kind of create that, that, that view in the morning. Um, but I, you know, I don't. I'm not sharing any of my poems because I, I never do. <laughs> no, no, okay, so this just like Actually, a yeah, this, thing. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which I encourage everyone to do. You know, like there's no such thing as a bad poem. It feels like it comes from the heart, and when you write it for yourself, it's it's quite it's quite a, a, a beautiful practice. So, um, so yeah, I, I, there's no wrong way to write a poem. You know, that's the other thing. It's um, it's much easier than making a film, actually, <laughs> in terms of just. <laughs> writing with a sheet of paper and like technically so you could give it a try <laughs> no but you know it, i think it also depends and like what, what is the what is the measure of technique you're you're most comfortable with because you know sometimes mm -hmm. putting the words it's much harder finding the exact words is much much harder than grabbing this the essence of the image sometimes you know the image mm -hmm. can say much more than the words can cover you know this moment when you feel like there's something stuck inside your throat and you can you cannot speak it out but you can actually feel it and you can actually see that so this is the another mm -hmm. like immersive practice of all of this Stuff. But um, I was actually wanted also to ask you about this, you know, the technique wise. Uh, do you write your poetry like you do the handwriting on the usual paper? Do you just say, because you see, I'm an analog person, like I have my phone, but mm -hmm. like still to grab all myself together, I'm trying to get everything handwritten because, you know, it also kind of, I you know, calms me down and whatever. But I know that currently with all of those new technologies and all of the development of literature itself and the development of new techniques, there's many new ways of how to do poetry. Because even though, like what you have just read, it's not the 
classical poetry in what we would understand it. It's not rhymed. It doesn't have this. It has a different inner rhythm than like what we used to see at school. And then there is very different types of poetry that currently emerge in it. For example, like 15 years ago, if someone would say that rap music is a poetry of its own, I guess the person would be booed. But now we have uh, the experience of, uh, for example, the Hamilton musical, which is uh, mm -hmm. a very good poetical piece, like poetry vice, it's very good. And you know, music-wise mm -hmm. it's very good and the first cast is just brilliant. And I can only say that because I've seen some snap videos on YouTube, but <laughs> I do believe it is. And um, I understand that there's so many different approaches of what you can actually call poetry nowadays. And there's a very, very, you know, thin line between what it is, what it used to be, and how I was transforming right now. And I'm, I'm quite passive, like, I, quite, I can imagine actually, you know, people reading poems and creating poems, especially now during current time, like, you know, self-reflective -refle pieces, even sitting at home and like that. But what do you do? How do you do that? Like sitting in front of your computer, writing it down, or maybe just, you know... Uh, I can't do anything on a computer, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I think I'm like you, you know, I, I need to be writing it in my, like, by hand um, to really think, you know, in a certain way. I've become that way with books too, you know, I travel a lot um, and so I got an iPad and tried to do the tablet thing for books but I, ca I, I cannot engage really the same way at all and so I just gave it to a friend and now I buy books and I leave books in places after I read them or I take them with me. And, um, but yeah, I think also there's, there's this thing about the speed of the brain and the, the opportunity to delete. I don't like, I, I also used to have a typewriter and I want to get another typewriter again. It's a very hipster thing to do, I know, but it's like they're actually the old typewriters. The reason I like using them are that they make you slow down because they're so slow, like the ones that are very hard to kind of type. And also you can't delete on those. Um, at least I don't ever have a ribbon that has a, a, a delete or um, a, an eraser. So it means that kind of, and by typing, it's different than writing. You could always scratch it out. But with typing, it's like once you say it, it's final. So it kind of slows you down to think differently as you're writing, but then also like challenges you to be more articulate because you can't just delete. You can't just write that and then delete it, which is what I do on a computer. I wish, I wish it wasn't the case, but my brain goes there because I'm used to this, you know, write it, write it, write it. Oh, never mind. I don't like that. Okay, da, da, da and just constantly editing and and also I type very fast so I can keep up with my brain and just like kind of project <laughs> myself you know like kind of barf on the screen but I don't think that um that that's the best way to really to really compose something you know so it's better to do by hand I think or with a kind of more analog um interface <laughs> yeah being a very old-fashioned in this creativity stuff <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and yeah. I just like to take this minute to in also remind all of our audience that if you have any questions, you can ask those questions. We have this comments format on YouTube or on Facebook. So if you would like to join the conversation, please just let us know. We will get all of your questions and desires. Maybe there is some kind of poem that you really would like to be read out today. You still have around like 15 minutes to do that. So just give us a hint that you would like to do that. And maybe you would like to listen to another poem that you've chosen for us today. Okay. Um, this one, let's see. This is the one that I thought would be fun to kind of say out loud because it's quite, the language is quite interesting. So, so uh, have patience with me because I'm a little, some of these words will be a little tongue-tied. That's <laughs> uh, okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> It's called, the poem is called What It Sounds Like by Forrest Gander. As grains sort inside a schist, an ancient woodland indicator called dog, dark dog's mercury, river like liquid shale and white tipped black lizard turds on the blue wall. For a loss that every other loss fits inside, picking a mole until it bleeds as the day heaves forward on faked determinations. If it's not all juxt juxtaposition, she asked, what is the binding agent? Creepy always to want to pin words 
and the emotional experience. Azur Oplia Cock Chafer, the Caddis Worm, the Bee Louse, Blister Beetle, Assassin Bug, the recriminations swarm around sunset. When it was otherwise quiet all the way around, you who were given a life, what did you make of it? Interesting one. <laughs> yeah, it, it definitely is. And I'm like, I must say that, um, you know, this, this is a, the, like, okay, not to say the magic of poetry, but when you're listening to, when you're listening to it, when you're listening to the spoken word, it sounds quite different than if you're reading it in the very same time. Because, you know, uh, when you're listening to it, you got so much caught up with the rhythm, you got so much caught up with the language. And even sometimes if you do not know what it means specifically, you might get a little bit of feeling of what is going on. Because I believe that about in line five till the end of the poem, I got myself feeling like, oh my God, I'm not even sure I know what this word means. <laughs> and I, yeah, yeah. And there was, but, but you know, there was like a back thought because like on the other hand, you're just listening to the, to the, like to the sound of language, to this melody of language, mm -hmm. and it doesn't really matter that much because in the end there is this final question, in in the poem and final question for all of us that like you know, are you caught up in everything around you? Like who, like what you what did you make of it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's a fun practice to kind of take a Gertrude Stein approach to language and just write stream of consciousness or to write things that have crazy sounds on your tongue or in your head when you see them together, words together. That's an interesting process too. I recently I was in writing a poem, I became kind of obsessed with the word lop, L-O-P, which is like in English, you know, is like when you lop something off, you like, you like, like you, I don't know, slice the top of it off or something. And they did that to these trees outside my, my apartment. They just like buzz the top of them off and the trees just look like they were like these sticks yeah, standing there like being like naked <laughs> like what do we do you know yeah. so yeah the poem became using the word lop and lopping and loppy loppiness and that word I just became kind of obsessed with it within the poem and became its own kind of exercise it's an awful poem and so I'm not going to share it with you but, <laughs> but it was still fun to like that try it an interesting one to listen to <laughs> Because you know, all the repetitions and the yeah, versions yeah, of the yeah. very same word. But I believe that you know, after that, our interpreters that are currently interpreting this session, they would definitely find us wherever we are and kill us. Because you know, when you're doing it orally, it's really hard to do that. Uh, but you know, I've also thought about this language games, and it kind of reminded me uh, about like it's not that much poetry, but you know, John Lennon, for example, he has a lot of books that he has written besides just the Beatles lyrics, lyrics and his own lyrics. But um, he is very, um, he also was very inclined with those, like playing with the language, you know, trying out, mm -hmm. make it flexible, making this language flow. And, and that was like something I really like because for me as a non-native non speaker of English, there was always something like you look at it and you like feel, okay, am I stupid enough? I don't understand what is written here. And you usually <laughs> have this kind of feeling when you're like reading out to those, you know, classical masterpieces, you're like, like, what? And when you're like yeah, doing yeah. poetry in a different language, it's always like, am I like, am I not getting something into it? But you know, with time and with practice, you're getting into it more and more. What do you think about spoken poetry, by the way? Because like you've decided to read out some poems for us today, read out loud. This is very courageous, actually. But what do you think about spoken poetry? <laughs> yeah, kind are of. Are you a little bit into it? Um. I love listening to it. I don't think I'm very into the art form compared to the reading poetry to oneself. I think I prefer reading poetry to myself. Spoken poetry this can be a bit performative in a way that is so beautiful, but it, to me it becomes a different kind of art form. So that's fine, and it's its own kind of form. Um, but... But yeah, I think, I think that's part of the challenge of reading these out loud, actually, as I've been in this quarantine doing this poetry in my head and not even reading it to my partner, who I love it, you know, and I could share it with him out loud, but I haven't been doing that. So I've just been hearing it the way you hear something in your head, I guess, or absorbing mm -hmm. it that way. And so I was kind of wanting to do this kind of challenge myself to, to share 
you know, what it sounded like in my head or something. So, um, so I'm aware that I'm not like a, a, a performative poet, a uh, spoken poet. Um, so I'm, I'm more just reading these kind of in the voice in my brain, but, uh, you, but that said, I remember that. going to, <laughs> thank you. I do remember going to, uh, it was like when I, I was invited to shoot something of a high school poetry, spoken word poetry mm-hmm. gathering in New York City that blew me away. It was like the way that people can use, you know, voice and inflection and breath to completely change a poem or to just to, to bring life to the poem that was meant to be told that way. Oof, I was shocked. I mean, it was like I was had shivers like for every second of the thing, you know, and I was mm-hmm. like, well... So that's that's something that hopefully I can engage in again once this quarantine's done too, <laughs> is going to see more performances or in-person things with poetry. Mm-hmm. Uh, final question before we get to yet another poem, because we're already running out of time, strangely. Oh um, my gosh, it's so fast. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask you, do you collect poetry books from the countries you visit? Because like you've been working in many different countries, you've been meeting many different people from different cultures, and you've been working very meticulously depicting the cultures that you see, which is you know, becoming slightly a part of it. So do you collect the books in the language of the countries you're working in? Oh no. I, I want to, but um, the easiest has been um, actually, my first film was shot in Afghanistan, and the easiest has been uh, Rumi is so translated that you can read every Rumi poem um, anywhere. So I became very excited about Rumi's poetry after shooting my film there. Um, and I got excited to when I heard that there were amazing poets in Ethiopia where I made my film in Besa. But actually, very few really, really terrific writers in Amharic have been translated to English. There's some universities who care about translating some of the Amharic, but um, unfortunately, I, I won't be able to read a lot of the poetry because, or a lot of even beautiful novels and things that have been written by by Ethiopians because I, I just don't know Amharic. It's quite a complicated language, actually. Um, it has its own alphabet, so it's like it's very hard to uh, for me to even grasp, you know, uh, anything. So, so that that's a shame because uh, I mean it's 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 because it's written in the mother tongue of the person who's writing it. So that that part's not a shame. That's amazing. What a shame is 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 that I I haven't been able to access it because I just don't know the language. But Spanish is easier. Um, my latest film was shot in Venezuela, and there's a uh, a, pres- a guy who used to be president of Venezuela. He's a, he was also a poet. He was also a novelist. And my film uses some of his writings. He's Romulo Gallegos. And but even for his incredible book that I use in my a little bit in my film, a reading from it, um, it's and in, he's he was president of Venezuela. You know, he's a very <laughs> famous man with famous writing. And there's only one translation in English of his book because it's very poetic language. It's, it's a prose, but it's written very, very densely. And so I had to buy it from the University of Pennsylvania language department, da, 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 to get it. Um, so yeah, that's, I guess, my biggest hurdle with the poetry is just trying to find, and I'm lucky. I mean, obviously a lot of things are translated into English. So, um, but yeah, that's been the hardest part about trying to share the poetry of the cultures is that it's best written in its own language and it's really hard to access. So I keep mm-hmm. trying. Yeah, okay, yeah, that's, mm-hmm. that's always like the issue that bothers me also because I know that, uh, okay, being a person from Ukrainian culture, I believe that there are very good poets and very good poetry in Ukraine, but it's very poorly translated into English. Like there's not mm-hmm. that many people who are actually doing it, but I think that this is, Again, you know, the legacy of minor cultures and minor countries, but I think we can fight through that. Anyway, we're running out of time, but I still would like to listen to the third poem that you have chosen for us today, you know, to end up this morning session with a good poetic note. Okay, cool. And this one's about quarantine, not to bring it always back to that, but like, but it, it, it's, it's not depressing though. <laughs> okay. Uh, the current isolation, isolationism by Camille Rankin. In the half-light, I am most at home. My shadow is company. When I feel hot, 
I push a button to make it stop. I mean the stain in my mind. I can't get it out. How human I seem, like modern man, a traffic in extinction. I have a gift, like an animal I sustain. A flock of birds, when touched, I scatter. I won't approach until the back is turned. My heart betrays, I confess, I am afraid. How selfish of me, when there's no one here, I have. The distance between our bodies infinitesim infinitesimally. In this long passageway, I pose against the wallpaper, dig my heels in, catch the light. In my vision, the back door opens on a garden that is always in bloom. The dogs are chained so they can't attack like I know they want to. In the next yard over, honeybees swarm and their sound is huge. <laughs> so I guess I brought it back to bees. <laughs> for the so it started with the bees, ended up with the bees. <laughs> No, but that, that's yeah. very nice. That's very, you know, that's very, I know, palp palpable. It's very tactile. So this one, mm -hmm. this last mm -hmm. one, it's actually, you know, something that I guess we're all missing slightly during the current time. That's a bit of a, let us say, human touch. <laughs> Understand mm -hmm. yeah. this, you know, the energy that exists when you're with, with someone and something in, in the room. It's always about this mm -hmm. little bit of the room intimacy that we're currently missing because of the physical distances but we just still need us <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 mo thank you very much for this beautiful poetic session from the very morning <laughs> i do believe that it's a very good thing to start our festival day today and I hope that the audience, even though no one was that courageous also to offer a reading of their own poem, <laughs> but, um, I do believe that they enjoyed it just as well as I did. And I think we'll just share, if, if we may, if, uh, if you will allow us, we'll just share the poems that you've read, for example, in the like, comment section on Facebook so that the people can reread it once again and, you know, to relive this experience. Mm. Uh, just also to get a little bit of taste of it and anyway they can actually see that because we're going to be recording these sessions anyway so thank you very much for joining us today thank you very much for presenting your film for Ducky Days Film Festival by the way Ambassa is still available at docuspace.org so please do not miss it out and thank you very much for being with us today yes thank you this is super fun have a good day <laughs> yeah you too and I would just like to remind our audience for the final time, you have the full day of very interesting things going on in DocuDays. So please follow us. We, right now in 20 minutes, you're going to have the Super Filmmaker session. So do not miss it out. So it's going to be definitely the right out Docu class and the tat a tat and happy hours. Uh, by the way, you can win a very nice t-shirt and a bag if you are going to be partying with us at the happy hours. That starts at 11 o'clock in the evening, so also check it out if you haven't checked it yet. And don't forget to vote for the competition film. It's really important for all of us. You see those five stars that you have under the frame, the video frame for the competition film. So as soon as you've ended up watching the film, please evaluate it. It's very important. We still have the audience award. Thank you very much for being with us. Stick for the soup with the filmmakers, follow DocuDice UI, and let us do the festival all together. Stay at home and stay safe. That's all, folks. <laughs>